Let me tell you who I am before I begin. I'm a historian for the San Diego Museum of Art, Artists Hill. This has put me in the position of learning about our contribution to the San Diego scene and the world. So as I was studying our history in the process of preparing a book about the history of the Guild over the past 100 years, I was able to delve into the stories of Ruth Hayward and Manuelita Brown. And I want to present those stories to you now. Ruth got degrees in mathematics and physics with a specialty in the propagation of electronic waves. So we're going to start with Ruth. Ruth said that her grandpa was sitting reading a newspaper in Martin, Tennessee in 1915. And he said, Ma, pack your bags. We're moving to San Diego. He read an article about the California Panama Exposition and decided that's where he wanted to be. So they moved. Ruth's mother was three years old at the time. Ruth had, was born and raised here in San Diego, and she likes to say she was born down south. Down south meaning Tula Vista. When someone described Ruth as the wise cracking sculptor of Balboa Park in the Voice of San Diego article in uh, 2010, they weren't far off. Ruth was an engineer with General Dynamics for 38 years. And think of a woman engineer in an earlier time period. A rare accomplishment indeed. There were many highlights to her career, but one that I will describe to you is when she was called by the French government to come over with her team and detect plastic explosives that were buried in the forest of Fontainebleau. They were able to detect these plastic explosives and remove them from 18 inches under the ground along with five ounces of hashish which was buried with the plastic explosives as a reward to the Algerian terrorist who was supposed to set off the explosives. So when she retired from this very exciting and fulfilling career and I've only mentioned one of the incidents she took up sculpting in bronze. And we are so glad she did. Kate Sessions is known as the mother of Balboa Park. She was a horticulturist, a botanist, and a landscape architect. And she passed away in 1940. She, in 1892, leased land in what was then City Park. Now we call it Balboa Park. And she established a nursery there. She planted 100 trees a year. That was one of the things that she did in order to beautify Balboa Park. We all benefit from her work yet today. And she founded the San Diego Floral Association, which is very active in maintaining the beauty of Balboa Park and many other places in San Diego. We go on and see another photo of Ruth sculpting. And you know, when you sculpt in bronze, you don't take a hunk of bronze and hit it. What you do is create the work in clay and then send it to the foundry where it is, a mold is cast and the liquid bronze is poured into the mold. Another photo of Kate Sessions and Ruth with her. You get very attached to your work. I know I do and I'm sure that someone sculpting real life size figures would as well. And the last picture of Kate Sessions shows you the way you see her today. She welcomes you into the into Balboa Park at uh, 6th Avenue and Laurel. You see her with a trowel in one hand and a plant in the other, a box of plants at her feet. She's ready to go ahead with her work. Margaret Sellers is the next image that you're seeing. Margaret Sellers was a woman of many firsts. She was the first woman to supervise letter carriers. She was the first woman to become postmaster of San Diego. The name may be familiar to you because there is a Margaret L. Sellers processing and distribution center along Highway 15 just north of Miramar. The sculptor of Margaret Sellers stands in that center today. Here we see Ellen Browning Scripps who lived from 1836 to 1932. Describing her as a journalist 
and philanthropists, these words are much too small for what this woman did. She created the largest American chain of newspapers that had ever been created. You may know the name Alan Browning Scripps for the Scripps Institute of Technology, for the Scripps Institute of Research, for the Scripps Green Hospital, for the Scripps Elementary School, for the Scripps Park that is in La Jolla. Ellen Browning Scripps in 1920 was worth $30 million. In 1924, she gave it all away to benefit mankind. She was a, a, had a generous spirit and she knew how to put her wealth to work for San Diego. This sculpture can be seen now by the main door of the Scripps Green Hospital. You're looking at Walter Ames. He is the founding director of the Timken Museum. He worked with the Putnam sisters who were well-to-do and they went to Europe and they bought one of each masterpiece that they liked. So it's a very eclectic collection that you see at the Timken, but they wanted San Diego forever for free to be able to see fine art. And this is the tradition today at the Timken. No entrance fee has ever been charged to get into the Timken. You would see this sculpture of Walter Ames in the central of the Timken Museum. You're looking at the Founders Plaza. Ruth said she made all these figures about 10% larger than life so they wouldn't look like midgets, which mm -hmm. they were not. You see Alonzo Horton and Ephraim Morse measuring for Balboa Park. When you think about it, it's extraordinary. There were only 2,300 people living in San Diego at the time. And these two men had the council set aside 1,400 acres, which is Balboa Park. It was way out in the country at the time, outside the city limits. And it certainly is the gem of San Diego today. The third man sitting here at Founders Plaza is George Marston. He came into the picture a little later in 1902, and he was appointed to the Park Improvement Committee, along with Kate Sessions at that time in 1902. George Marston arranged for the same architect who had designed Central Park in New York to design Balboa Park. So we're beholden to all these founders for the work that they did to create the park that we all enjoy today. You may recognize here Lily Tomlin. Lily Tomlin donated work from some of her performances to the Rachel Women's Center. Ruth was on the board of the Rachel's Women's Center for years. This is a home, a place for homeless women or women that needed shelter. The Rachel Women's Center wanted to thank Lily for her contribution and have her bust sculpted. Lily wasn't wild about the idea. In fact, it turned out she was quite shy, but she was convinced to sit for this portrait. So when it was completed and about to be revealed to the world in front of the cameras, it was covered with a cloth. Ruth said to Lily, don't you want to see it, you know, before we unveil it? And Lily said, no, I'm an actress. I know how to react. And she did. <laughs> and she loved it. And we see there it is now. So this is one of these private pieces that you may not know about that is a tribute to Ruth and all that she has done for the city of San Diego. We turn from Ruth to Manuelita. Manuelita Brown is a former mathematics instructor who has achieved many accomplishments and rewards in her lifetime. And one of the accomplishments that we are most grateful for is that she was president of the Guild from 2006 to 2007. And believe me, that was a labor of love. On a trip to Ghana with her husband, Manuelita heard Maya Angelou speak. And an African man in the audience said, why aren't there sculptures in America celebrating all that Black Americans have contributed to that country? And Maya Angelou said, well, no one's sculpting them and no one's funding them. And this really lit a flame within Manuelita. And to quote her, she um, says, I want viewers of my work to respect the strength, the character, and the beauty of my people, the descendants of African survivors in the Americas. It happened in 1972 that two bronze sculptures were taken out of the ocean near Calabria. And these had been sculpted in 450 and 460 BC. And everyone got so excited, historians, anthropologists, sociologists, uh, everyone was excited to see these two sculptures, to see exactly what these men looked like, what they wore, their size, their shape, everything. 
And Manuelita wanted to work in bronze so that people would, a hundred years from now, know these were the Black Americans who lived at this time, at our time. Here are the common everyday people sitting on the stoop, talking to their children. And then the uncommon people contributed tremendously to the American experience. Here you see Justice Thurgood Marshall. And this sculpture, which Manuelita did in terracotta, stands on the uh, in the Thurgood Marshall campus of the UCSD. She was working there at that time, and so she donated this piece to the university. Justice Thurgood Marshall, to remind you, was the first African-American who served on the Supreme Court. He was Associate Justice of the Supreme Court from 1967 to 1991, and was responsible for bringing so many laws into an action that helped people to lead more fuller lives in America. Here you see Verity. This is the sculpture that was exhibited in the Oceanside Museum of Art when the Guild presented a hundred artists and their work to the world, something that hadn't been done ever. I again use Manuelita's own words to describe this piece. Coy, innocent, cautiously investigating the truth of youth. I'm sure we can all remember exploring the truth of youth and maybe stepping out where we had never stepped out before. And again, quoting Manuelita, whatever her name, when a young woman explores beyond her space, she will likely be called back by her mother or grandmother. Missy, I think we've all heard that at some point in our life when we have maybe gone beyond where our mother or our parents thought we might be going. You have probably seen these dolphins in the Westfield University Town Center. They're life-size. They are cavorting through these pools of water. In order to sculpt these, which Manuelita did, she went in 1999. She went to SeaWorld and observed dolphins at play. Not the trained ones, but the ones that were interacting with each other freely. And she came up with these eight life-size sculptures, which to this day impress and delight shoppers at the mall. If you've never seen them, they're worth a trip there. They're really marvelous. Here's the Encinitas Child, which she dedicated in 2010. This was dedicated to all Encinitas children. The child sits along Highway 101, welcoming people south as they approach Encinitas. She's a beach child, encouraging you to come south and enjoy all the beauty and the treasures that we have here. King Triton, a familiar sight to many of you, as this mascot stands near the stadium on the campus at UCSD. This was sculpted in 2008. King Triton was chosen as a mascot because the campus is near the Pacific Ocean and because of the close relationship between the university and Scripps Institute of Oceanography. The father of King Triton was Poseidon and his mother was Aphrodite. He's half man and half fish. And Manuelita says he should look confident, but not menacing. He should be approachable and yet at the same time impressive. And he certainly is. In his hand he has a conch shell and by blowing on that conch shell uh, produced a very loud noise which was said to either roil up the sea or calm it and at least to frighten off any rivals who might approach. Here we see Sojourner Truth, an abolitionist and woman's right activist who escaped to freedom in 1826. She's known for giving a speech to the Women's Rights Convention in Akron, Ohio in 1851. And in order to make that speech sound more like a black woman should sound, they gave her a Southern accent and called the speech, Ain't I a Woman? Well, Sojourner Truth never spoke like that. In fact, her first language was Dutch. She was owned by a Dutch master north of New York City in a small town. Manuelita has paid close attention to the physicality of Sojourner Truth. She was six foot one, which is very unusual in her times and would still be striking today. Manuelita also paid attention to the fact that on her hand, the hand that is holding a Bible, one finger is missing. This was due to a farm accident while she was still enslaved. Strikingly, Sojourner Truth was always depicted carrying a Bible and she preached walking through the fields in the Northeast, but she couldn't read. 
She had someone read the Bible to her. Manuelita pointed out to the students at UCSD when this sculpture was unveiled, all the advantages that they had that she never enjoyed. Having created and sold many small maquettes of Sojourner Truth, Manuelita dreamed of creating this life-size sculpture, which she did through crowdfunding. So it is thanks to many that this sculpture stands today at the Good Marshall campus at UCSD. Following the end of the Civil War, Sojourner Truth fought for the emancipated slaves to receive 40 acres and a mule. This didn't happen, but it wasn't for lack of effort on the part of Sojourner Truth. Again, Manuelita grew very close to Sojourner Truth and was very moved by her life. And so Maria Manuelita wrote this in the voice of Sojourner Truth. I am woman, taller than most men or women, stronger than many men or women, mother, preacher, teacher, speaking out against slavery, speaking for women's suffrage. I am a black woman, a slave in my previous life, reborn to serve God and mankind and renamed to serve notice to all. I'm an American woman walking across the fields and claiming the fruits of freedom for every man, woman, and child. We thank Manuelita for her vision and her bringing to life Sojourner Truth for us. And now I have the pleasure of introducing you to these two women in person. They are with us here today. I'm going to start with Ruth. Ruth, could you please show us the piece that you want to display? And you said there was a story about where it is placed today, which you didn't share with me, but you said there's another whole story <laughs> where the sculpture could be found today. A friend of mine was the uh, development person for the Scripps uh, organizations, and they were apparently had a donor that wanted to donate some funds to spiff up some a fancy bunch of rooms at, at Scripps Green Hospital, and they were going to name the, the rooms for Ellen Valley and Scripps. And so the, the uh, development person asked me, could I sculpt and have a bus cast of, of Ellen? And I said, yes, I would. And then after I did it, they decided that they liked it so well, it didn't go into the room. They used it to divide where the traffic goes, go into the main lobby at, at, uh, at Scripps Green. And it was actually a very nice place, but apparently it was, it, uh, it was not up to, to the fire code. So after a couple of years, they made the move it. And now it's outside, kind of on a giant blank wall, and it's just swallowed up, and the, and the elements have, have uh, ruined the patina on it. So that's that's the story about Ellen Browning's scripts. Thank you, Ruth. And we'll start with the first one. Oh. Do you see it? Yes, yeah. I'm not sure what you can see versus what I'm seeing. But We're seeing three figures, and they're facing to, to the screen right. Okay, and that's the only thing you're seeing right now, right? Yes. Okay. Um, so there's three figures. I decided to do a sculpture that represented a lot of the unrest and challenge to systems that's going on essentially around the world. When I first started this, I was thinking about Black Lives Movement, because the Black Lives Matter movement, because that was what was happening around me. But as I worked on it, uh, because it takes a while working on pieces, uh, with starting with clay and going through the whole process. There were types of movements going on around the world. In Nigeria, they were fighting against the police, and um, but there was a fighting against uh, or campaigning against uh, the government in Belarus. Um, oh, and yeah. there was always uh, things that were going on in South America as well. And on all of these protests, people were raising their fists in solidarity. And so I decided this didn't just represent Black Lives Movement, it represented all of the movements that were going on around the world. What size are these? It's very hard to imagine. Uh, they are 16 inches high, including okay. the base. Okay. This gives, gives you an idea of the, of the base and, and how I've used, designed the base to fit the title, Uphill Struggle. So you see that the, the base represents going uphill. It is not a, a flat base. 
and he's on much older, but his son is running it now. So it's still MC3. MC and oh, yeah. McClellan. There was that last. Mine is closer to Long Beach, so you know. But yeah. there, you know, once when, you once you get a foundry that you really can work with, and you appreciate what they do, and they listen to you, that's what you stay with. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I'm delighted that we were able to spend time with you today and that you had a chance to meet each other. Once again, I'm so grateful that I work in acrylic and I don't have to worry about going to the foundry or handling clay or all the other events that you need to put into place in order to do what you do and do so well. Again, thank you for being so generous with your time today. Thank you.